Welcome to the podcast of discovergreece.com, where we give you all the travel inspiration you need to dream about and plan your next trip to Greece. Our podcasts are designed to add even greater depth and color to your holidays. We explore local traditions and culture, bring museums and archaeological sites to life, and we go to the source of the Mediterranean food and drink we all love so much. Most of all, we look for the stories of the people behind the travel experience. Think of our podcasts as a first glimpse of the memories you'll be taking home when you visit. We are in the old town of Corfu, which has been designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And in this podcast, we are going to discover the history and significance of one of the town's two iconic fortifications, the Old Fortress. To understand the history of Corfu's Old Fortress, you have to go way back to the 6th century AD, hundreds of years before anything even resembling today's structure was even built. It was a time when the main settlement of Corfu was known as Paleopolis, an ancient city located near the area of Canoni, around four kilometers south of today's old town. You can still see ruins of the ancient city today. Barbarian raids were common, and eventually the surviving inhabitants of Paleopolis were forced to relocate to the eastern edge of today's city. They chose a rocky peninsula with two hills or pigs, and it was here, during the Middle Ages, that Corfu got its name, Corifo, from the Greek word for pig. This rocky peak became the city of Corfu until the end of the 16th century, when it was completely transformed into a fortress. The inhabitants moved into the area outside the walls, known as Xopoli, or Outer Town, and from this point on, the fortress was used exclusively as a military base. As it turned out, the fortress was a central part of the defenses of just about every civilization, an occupying power that has passed through Corfu. And as you're about to find out, there have been many. From 1084 to 1204, Corfu was ruled by the Byzantines, until the Byzantine Empire broke up and its territories were redistributed. Then came the first Venetian rule, which lasted just ten years. The despotate of Epirus, one of the states that emerged from the breakup of the Byzantine Empire, were the next to arrive. They lasted over half a century, and then, from 1267 to 1386, came the Angevins of Naples, the kingdom of southern Italy. Whether it was emperors of the Byzantine period, the rulers of Epirus, or the Angevins of southern Italy, they each brought their customs and wielded power in their own way. But there's one thing they had in common, the fortress on the peninsula defined by its two peaks. The land tower and sea tower, the two most prominent features of today's old fortress, date from this period. And from just the size of them, it isn't hard to see how a fortress that seemed virtually conquer-proof to invaders began to take shape. For the locals, it wasn't always about who they wanted to keep out. When it came to the deeply unpopular Angevins of Naples, it was about throwing them out. And to do that, they turned to the state of Venice. They summoned the leader of the Venetian fleet to Corfu and declared their intention to submit to the Venetian state. The Venetians quickly realized the strategic and commercial advantages that Corfu would give them. And so, in 1386, the Angevins of Naples were defeated, and the second and by far the longest Venetian rule of Corfu began, lasting more than 400 years until 1797. 
This coincided with the most decisive period in the development of the old fortress, and of Corfu in general. The main enemy of the Venetians at the time were the Ottomans, who dominated the Mediterranean area, including most of Greece. Ottoman raids on Corfu were frequent, and to withstand them, the Venetians set about upgrading their defenses. This led to the modernization of Corfu's mighty fortress, and the city generally, to withstand the new threat of the time, the cannon. The biggest and perhaps most important change came when an artificial channel, a kind of moat, was dug between the peninsula and the mainland. It was called the Contrafossa. And with it, the fortress was transformed into an island fortress. Access to the mainland was over a wooden drawbridge. The Venetians also converted the tall square Byzantine towers of the fortress into round, smooth ones, making them practically impossible to climb. Another major advantage of the fortress was its easy access to the sea, so the Venetians reinforced this by creating a military harbour in the area of Mandraghi, where they built the Soranza Gate, or Porta Soranza. This was the main entrance to the fortress until the middle of the 16th century. Within all of this, 1537 was a decisive year for Corfu and for the history of the fortress. This was the year of the first siege of Corfu by the Turks. Suleiman the Magnificent, the tenth and longest reigning sultan of the Ottoman Empire, arrived in Corfu with more than 300 ships. At his side was the legendary admiral of the Ottoman navy, Hayreddin Barbarossa, named after his flame-red beard and known for his fearsome attacks across the Mediterranean, where his fleet attacked and plundered enemy ships. Capturing Corfu was meant to be a vital part of the Ottomans' war against Venice. Ottoman ships spread from the old fortress to present-day Ipsos Beach, some 15 kilometers to the north. 25,000 Ottoman troops landed on Corfu, destroying around 140 villages and inhabited areas of Xopoli, in other words, all the way up to the walls of the old fortress. But despite everything the Ottomans threw at it, the fortress was not captured. The bravery of the Venetians and local soldiers and the combination of hunger and illness in the Sultan's troops ended the siege in a matter of weeks. Still, it was a devastating attack and the Venetians knew that it could have cost them the domination of the island and so began an extended period of even greater fortification of Corfu. And when it came to fortification, the Venetians were masters. They employed the best military architects of the time, with names like Michele San Micheli, Ferrante Vitelli, Filippo Verneda, legends in their field, recruited to strengthen the old fortress and the perimeter fortification of Xopoli. Before long, the old fortress was impregnable. How so? Well, first of all, two massive bastions were remodeled, the Savorgan and Martinengo bastions, at either end of the Contrafossa Canal. And between them, the Porta Maggiore gate was constructed along with a drawbridge separating the peninsula from the fortress. In doing so, the Porta Maggiore became the main gate rather than the Porta Soranza at Mandraghi Harbour. At the same time, the Contrafossa was widened and extensive works were carried out to extend the free firing area for defenders on the shore side of the main gate. The Venetians had already forbidden any construction in front of the fortress, and they now demolished around 2,500 houses. By 1628, an area of around 84,000 square meters had been freed up. It's fascinating to think that what was once used as a firing range is now the old town's Spianada Square. But we still get a hidden reminder of this history in the name of the square. The Italian verb spianare means to flatten. As well as being the largest square in the Balkans, it is one of the centers of everyday life in Corfu today. You won't be surprised to hear that the resourceful Venetians didn't stop there. They added facilities inside the fortress to make it fully functional a prison, ammunition depots, a bell tower, a well, and the Catholic chapel of Madonna del Carmine. The remarkable thing in this story is how the Venetians used their know-how 
rather than numerical superiority as a weapon. The fortress and fortified city around it helped them resist a further two Turkish sieges in 1571 and in 1716. In the last siege, the general of the Venetians was a German aristocrat called Matthias von de Sullenberg. His army of only 5,000 men successfully repelled 33,000 Ottoman soldiers. The Venetians built a statue in his honor, which you can see at the entrance to the fortress. It took until 1797 when Napoleon Bonaparte defeated the Republic of Venice for the Venetians' control of Corfu to end. For a handful of years, Corfu was under the rule of the French Republicans. Then, for seven years, came a Russian-Turkish alliance, during which time the semi-autonomous Ionian state was created. This included a number of Ionian islands and Corfu as the capital. It was the turn of the imperial French next, for about seven years until 1814, when lastly, Corfu came under the military control of the British, along with the rest of the Ionian Islands. This marked the beginning of Corfu's time as a protectorate of the United Kingdom, and there was no way that the British wouldn't add their touches to the old fortress. In went another two barracks, a military hospital and a bell tower that replaced the Venetian one although it retained many of its original Venetian elements. They added another ammunition depot and converted the wooden drawbridge into a permanent stone one. And they built the Church of St. George in the Georgian architectural style for the British garrison. The time of the British protectorate was when the old fortress took its final form. And so, after eight centuries and a revolving door of occupiers and external rulers, We arrive at 1864, when Corfu was united with the Kingdom of Greece. Finally, Corfu had its independence and the island's grand fortress became the property of the people of Corfu. Today, the old fortress stands as a monument reflecting the full and colorful history of Corfu. Much of it is open to visitors and many of the surviving Venetian and British buildings have been given new uses. Walking across the stone bridge, built by the British over the Contrafossa, you see that fishing boats now moor in the canal. And just by the main entrance, the Porta Maggiore Arcade, introduced by the Venetians, now houses the Byzantine collection of Corfu. Inside, you can learn about the historical and artistic history of medieval Corfu. It's well worth visiting. You'll find Byzantine frescoes and sculptures, and a mosaic floor from the early Christian Basilica of Paleopolis, the ancient city of Corfu, from where the islanders once relocated and our journey began. Continuing around the old fortress, you reach one of the two British barracks. This one houses the Central Library of Corfu, which was the first public library in Greece. It opened in the mid-18th century and has a remarkable collection of books, many from before 1900. The oldest is from 1480. It's a treasure trove for researches preserving a unique part of Greece's cultural heritage. From here, it's a short walk to the Church of St. George, which is now an Orthodox church. Cultural events are held in the open space in front of the church, where there is a cafe that you can sit at with a view of the Ionian Sea. On the other side of the fortress, to the north, are the second British barracks. These are now home to the Department of Music Studies of the Ionian University. You might not be able to visit it, but as you pass by, listen out for the melodies of the students. From here, you can head down a tunnel that leads to Mandraki Harbour which is now a marina for sailing boats and has a restaurant. 
but we've left the best till last. Back in the fortress, near the bell tower, there is a path, this time heading up and ending at the land tower. It passes the British bell tower, the Venetian prison, and gun ports once loaded with cannons. The top of the tower is the highest point of the fortress, where you'll find a giant cross and a lighthouse. From here, the whole of Corfu town spreads out before you. You can see all of Spianada Square and the tile roofs of the old town. And behind that is the new fortress on St. Mark's Hill, built by the Venetians in the 16th century. You can just imagine the perimeter walls once linking the two fortresses, forming a protective hug around the old town. Elsewhere, you can see Corfu's main port and the island of Vidos, and, from the other side, the Bay of Garitza. Over the Ionian Sea, you can even make out the mountains of Epirus on the mainland. It's the perfect spot to think about how many flags have flown from this tower and how many different occupiers have watched raids from this very point. So many of them repel because of the incredible fortifications surrounding you. It's a piece of Corfu history you'll never forget. Today's journey was brought to you with the support of Ecos Resorts. This is where we say goodbye and hope that you enjoyed this episode of discovergreece.com's podcasts. If you want to hear more stories from around Greece, follow us on Spotify, Google Podcasts or Apple Podcasts. See you soon!